Okay, we are live. Welcome to the quick edition of the Drupal Easy Podcast. We'll have to come up with a good, good branding for this once we start doing more of them. But uh, we call it the DE to... Podcast because it's short and quick. <laughs> DEP, um, just just keep it short. The, the, the Department of Environmental Protection. I don't know. Okay. DEP, I think is that. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that we have ever done a video of our podcast before, but in, in interest of doing something quicker that we can get out faster, I kind of talked Mike into this idea of doing something short that I could maybe do just while I'm on a lunch break or something like that. And also at the last minute, I was like, let's stream it live. Screw it. We're doing it live. <laughs> Is that a Bill O'Reilly reference? Possibly. Yes. Uh, except for maybe edited for television. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan Price, for today. And uh, Mike and I started this podcast eight years ago. Am I making that number up? No, I think, I, think we I just were, said that the other day. We were just talking about that, yeah. Yeah. And now Drupal is a force to be reckoned with in the universe. Uh, but one of the things that's kind of painful about Drupal is upgrading from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 was a little bit hard and upgrading from Drupal 7 to 8, while the migrate process has gotten much easier, the fact that like some contributed modules don't exist, the API has completely changed, the theming is completely different. Um, you're seeing this like big sort of like hesitation for some people to want to make the jump, even though starting a new project in Drupal 8 today is fantastic, right? Lovely. Uh, I don't recommend anybody really start a new project in Drupal 7 unless you have some really good reasons. Uh, the question then comes out, what will happen to the world when Drupal 9 is released? What will even Drupal 9 look like? So our benevolent dictator for life, Dries, put out a blog post this week sort of addressing the way that he thinks it may go. So Mike, do you want to give us a, a little summary of what's going on here? Yeah, so I read this blog post and I, I kind of realized or thought to myself that, hey, this is kind of one of those blog posts that we, we don't get too often that is really kind of setting direction. Not Actually, maybe not setting direction, but kind of um, announcing what a lot of people have been talking about and just kind of assuming is going to happen in the future. Um, and, you know, when we moved to Drupal 8, we now have this, this semantic version and we have these point releases where we can actually add stuff to Drupal core. We saw an 8.1, we saw an 8.2, and we're gonna see an 8.3 here in a, in a couple of months. And so the question that has been kind of, you know, being talked about in the community is, well, how do we decide when we do Drupal 9? Is that just like a really big point release or are we gonna do something bigger or smaller? Like what? What does that mean? Or is there ever going to be a Drupal 9 or going to be at like Drupal 8.112 in a few years? Um, so Dries kind of put out this, and I'm not sure if you can call this a proposal or it sounds like this is kind of the way things are going. Um, but we're going to continue to do these Drupal 8 point releases for a while. And then at some point in the future, um, we're going to draw a line in the sand as a community and release Drupal 9. And the only difference between the last Drupal 8 point release and Drupal 9 will be the removal of deprecated code. And that's right. a huge difference from what from the way our community has operated um, in the past. So Ryan, you want to just real quick kind of talk about what that means, like removing deprecated code and, and what that means to you know module developers specifically? Yeah, I mean, right. Typically, when you are doing an upgrade from one version of Drupal to another, you have no choice but to rewrite functions. Like, you know, if someone decides that they want to rewrite the way a function signature works, like especially in the new object-oriented world, right? You want to change the, the type hinted class that this argument accepts from one thing to another. The, the standard way of doing that would be to say, this is deprecated, and in the future, you have to rewrite all your stuff this way. Um, PHP in modern years has gotten now new tools that when you use one of these deprecated functions, your your IDE or you know your other sorts of like code you know uh, quality tools can give you a hint and say this function is deprecated. You shouldn't use it. I think one of the examples is like 
when you run Drush in certain situations, Drush can sort of warn you like, hey, you're using a thing that's going to be out of date soon. So different stuff like that. Uh, so when you now, you know, in the old days, upgrade from seven to eight, you had no choices. You must update or else. What we're saying now is as a new API gets written for Drupal 8, 8.4, 8.5, and so on, in the 8 series, you will be able to use those old deprecated functions still. Your, your, any module written for Drupal 8 of any lifecycle should be forwards compatible, not necessarily backwards compatible. And then when we get to Drupal 9 will be the day that we say all that backwards compatible stuff is going to get turned off. And that's the day you will have to rewrite your code. Hopefully, we've given you plenty of time. Every six months, we have a new release. So is it two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now? Doesn't matter. Whenever we decide Drupal 9, the only thing that's really changing, because now we have experimental modules, we have the ability to add new APIs to core, we have the ability to change the core themes during the lifecycle of Drupal 8, which are things we would never have done until Drupal 8 came out. Those kinds of changes are happening all the time in Drupal 8 land, but we have, you know, stable theme and we have experimental themes. We have now, stable modules and experimental modules. I think what you mentioned a second ago is really important. You know, it's having to do with time and tools, right? As a module developer, hopefully we've given, you know, the community gives module developer the time and tools to update their deprecated functions to the new API. Um, I don't think the time Ish, the, the time aspect, I don't think is going to be an issue because I think there's always going to be the time, you know, because these point releases are, are, they're, are twice a year. So minimum, you'll have six months. Um, the tools is where I, you know, Dries mentioned this in the blog post. I thought this was really interesting because um, if you think about it, we have the technology to identify these deprecated, you know, functions or, and deprecated classes or, you know, you know, in code and we can do it you know, there can be a tool written for Drush that will, you know, you run a Drush command against the module, it will tell you if you have anything that's been deprecated. Same thing for Drupal console. Um, you can even envision something that actually runs on Drupal.org itself. So that on the module project page, um, you can see, you know, warning, this module utilizes 13 deprecated functions that will no longer work after Drupal 9 on, you know, whatever the release date is. Yeah, right. So I think there's some potential for some really useful tools to kind of, you know, give gentle pokes to module maintainers and say, hey, you know, fix your stuff because if you want it to work in Drupal 9, you've got to get rid of this old stuff. And just, you know, think about what we're talking about here. I mean, I think this is amazing because module developers have always known that, oh no, new major release of Drupal 7 is coming out. I've got to rewrite all of the things. Potentially, that's going to be a thing of the past. Potentially, this is something that module maintainers can do just as a, ma as a matter of ongoing maintenance of the module. That's a huge change. And that basically means when Drupal 9 comes out, there's not going to be this lag time. There's not going to be any reason to have any lag time for modules to get caught up. Right. And I think it's, it's you know, on the whole, there's just this shift from a, let's say, hobbyist mentality and hacker type software to supportable software. And I think some people saw that as a negative. That wasn't the Drupal they grew up with. And for other people, I mean, like I'm looking at, you know, right now we have a Drupal 7 distribution that I'm supporting every day. And we have all these questions about like, well, is there ever going to be a Drupal 8 version of this? You know, like we can't take advantage of all these new fun things that are coming out, but the work of building a new distribution on a new version of Drupal, nobody even is talking about that as a possibility right now, right? That's that's something that is potentially would make this project be two or three times the size of what it is, is having to start without that distribution, without that existing framework, without that like community tested and vetted code. No one's, no one's even bringing that up as a possibility. Every time it comes up, it's like, well, yeah, it, it's a it's a good idea, but it's not happening inside <laughs> of this cycle, right? Right. So, so there's that going on. But if you were to then say, well, actually, we're on Drupal eight. This this distribution came out during the eight point two era, but 
now we want to apply one of these new experimental core modules you know like media is coming right by hopefully by the end of the year we'll have a experimental solution for media that's something that as a as a person who does a lot of things with media videos and podcasts i'm very very interested in being able to say to my clients this is this is the way to do media in drupal in the past there have been 10 different ways to do it so uh, and then, you know, just that, that idea that Drupal can have new features that are core features and upgrading to them is no harder than any, any other like major module version upgrade, like, right. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, the difference between, uh, let's say path auto version two and path auto version three, right. There's obviously an upgrade process there, but that's a it's a known process you can take from one to the other so that's sort of like it's a it's a major upgrade of a minor component yeah so let me ask a question because this was one of uh, uh, the sections in Dries's blog post was um, he specifically mentioned that these point releases updating you know from an 8.2 dot whatever to an 8.3 dot o should be no more difficult than you know like you just said a module update or a, or, or a security release or something like that um so in your experience so far ryan um have you seen i mean have you have, have you seen any issues with going between point releases and drupal 8 i think the big still sticky point is if you if you were using an experimental module in production Nobody has ever said that experimental modules must work perfectly backwards compatible. Hmm. I don't think that's an expectation. It's a potentially it's a large burden, right? From the code perspective and also from the database perspective. Obviously, the contributors make every effort possible, but sometimes you make bad decisions during development, right? And you want you want to be able to make that change so that the day that you say this is stable, that it also is the best thing that we could have possibly released at that time. Yeah, I think I had a small issue. It was actually on DrupalEasy.com. I believe I was using Big Pipe before it was experimental and in core on it at 8.0. 8 and then when I went to 8.1, I'm not sure where the issue lies. I don't know if I didn't realize Big Pipe was in there and I still had it in Contrib, but now it was also in core, but I had, I probably had a half hour worth of panicking trying to figure out what the heck was going on before I realized, um, you know, that it was just, you know, I had two big pipes and hmm. two big pipes does not equal one really big pipe. That's <laughs> but other than that, I mean, they have been absolutely just seamless, you know, updates and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's really kind of a, a huge change from just a couple of years ago in the Drupal community where we had, you know, Drupal five and, that was it for a couple of years. And you know, worst yet was probably Drupal 7, where we were just stuck with things like, you know, a non-responsive, you know, default theme, you know, up until about a year and a half ago in Drupal. That was almost unacceptable. So how about um, let me ask you, do you think module maintainers, this will make their lives easier or more difficult? Because on one hand, they only had to kind of go through the upgrade once. But on, you know, in this new system, they're going to have to, I don't want to say constantly be on the lookout, but, you know, a couple times a year at least, they're going to have to be on the lookout to update the module and get rid of these deprecated functions. Is that a net positive? I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it somewhat depends on the kind of module maintainer that you are, right? Like, in the past, you put something up on Drupal.org and you don't update it for three years, and there wasn't that much of an indication that, that there was anything to be worried about, you know. But now we have things like the security team saying to modules that haven't been updated in a while, "Hey, this module might have security problems. We are not really taking a look at this actively, or we have identified that this pattern, you know, exists here." So the idea that like there is module rot, which has always existed, is now sort of like more visible and more public. Um, so when I'm doing my research these days, you know, I'm looking at things and it's like, oh, this has only got a dev version out and it's got not no green shield, you know, like, so I think there is better 
communication to even those you know non-expert users about what 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 is on the label is exactly what you're getting you know it's no more no less it, it could potentially be even more visible with a tool like we mentioned earlier that lists you know how many deprecated functions this or even yeah, if you just were to say like uh, some sort of a check that would just say like this module may not be compatible with Drupal 9, right? Right. This uses deprecated functions. It's like a really simple, just like they have with that green shield, you know, like mm -hmm. ready for nine, nine green check mark, something like that. That would be awesome. Absolutely. All right. So let's, um, there's one more bit of this that I wanted to bring up, and it came from the comments. Um, and there's a comment from uh, Fina Proxima, his name is Adam, um, and I believe he's on the Octo team. Uh, with Acquia. And he actually proposed that another big change for Drupal 9, in addition to getting rid of deprecated code, would be to completely switch over to Composer as the one and only one way to build a Drupal code base. Um, going so far, um, you know, completely ripping off the Band-Aid and getting rid of info.yaml files. Um, in exchange for composer uh, um, dependencies. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. And I've actually, this is something I've been talking to people um, more than a few times in the past couple of weeks. It's just kind of come up. Um, you know, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to keep Drupal pushing, you know, forward, you know, it, it being the most modern um, way to develop as possible. Um, but Damien McKenna, you know, an old friend of our podcast, um, he, you know, he left a comment, which I think encapsulated what a lot of, you know, maybe not a lot, but some people are worried about. If we do that, are we raising the bar too high for introductory Drupal developers? Because right now, anybody can come and download um, a, a tarball from Drupal.org extract it, point it to a database, and boom, you've got a Drupal site up and running. Well, so here's here's where I go with that. Yeah. I think then you start seeing the difference between Drupal and Drupal distributions like you have between Linux kernel and Linux distributions, right? Mm -hmm. Linux distro provides you with a tool that does those updates more or less automatically, right? Mm -hmm you can build sort of like a user-friendly front on it. So maybe what needs to happen if we really want to be able to get rid of Drupal.org packaging and move to Composer packaging is either the ecosystem, right? Which, you know, I'm going to go back to our good friends uh, in Colorado, Web, Web Enabled. They have had this idea for years that you could go to a site, click a button, install a distro. And I think there are other hosting partners that do this as well. Sure. Like, you want to have a copy of Open Atrium. You want to have a copy of Aquia Lightning, whatever whatever yeah. the distributions of the day are. Well, Aquia Dev does that. And push the button and get those upgrades for you, right? And as long as you sort of like stay on the reservation, you know, it's there's there would be a more or less automatic way to do the upgrades. And so more like software as a service but it's running open source code and it's running your configuration of it. You're not running, you know, medium where you don't get to control everything. You only get to control the theming of medium, right? Right. Whereas I think with, with Drupal, the, the promise is you can make your site, you can do all the things you want to do. And if you have the ability to set up your own GitHub repo and put your own composer JSON file in there, then we can just, pull your composer JSON file and we could run your code as a service also. I don't think that we're that far off in a world where hmm. Docker and other sorts of virtual machines are like deployable to my laptop. I think that that's not that ambitious of a goal. So I think what you're, so let me just repeat this back or part of what you just said, because this is interesting. I hadn't thought about this before. So I think what you're saying is kind of the, the low level you know, Drupal install becomes a composer-based install. And that's what developers use. And um, if you're really familiar with things, that's what you use. You download that composer.json, you run composer install, and it, 
you know, installs everything you need for Drupal. Which is similar to like, if you want to do core development today, right? You can only do Composer. Right. If you want to, if you want to hack mm -hmm. on core for 8.3 that's not out yet. Right, Composer but I think, what's, only choice. I think the interesting thing of what you said is, you know, there's that, and that, you know, that satisfies what Adam proposed, is we can move completely to a Composer-based, you know, development. The developers uh, get their candy. Yes. But then there's also this other thing, which kind of sits on top of it, which you use the analogy of the Linux kernel to a Linux distribution that is prepackaged. So all of that composery stuff is done off on a server somewhere. And then the end result is, hey, here's a nice friendly package for you to download. It's a tarball, extract it, and poof, there you go. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, let's say, Android smartphones as an example, mm -hmm. There are so many things that go into building one of those distributions. Same thing with a Linux distribution. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do it yourself? Sure. Is it worth the time to build your own? Absolutely not, right? You want to go and you want to find someone who's gotten 95% of the way there, and you just want to package in a few extra little apps or change around one preference screen, you should go to CyanogenMod or one of these other sort of like open source Android distributions that is more or less easy to build and deploy to your custom device where they have figured out the tooling already and, and apply that, right? It still requires developer level knowledge, like mm -hmm. DevOps kind of knowledge to be able to do something along those lines, but it's way more accessible than you saying like, I'm going to take the raw source code and I'm going to do something with it. And I'm going to develop this like, totally new user experience from the ground up you know like that that feels really daunting and i realize like drupal we're not necessarily saying is as complicated as android right which has probably hundreds of systems that need to work with each other but at the same time people are starting to use drupal for all kinds of things that are not just websites so developing apis being the back end for these mobile applications you know, being like a centralized data store that is like traffic cup between all these different apps and, and services that those kinds of things, if you want to keep using Drupal and you want to still get sort of like, at the end of the day, I still would like to be able to log into a website and push a couple of buttons and have whatever messages it is be sent out. And I want to use the same platform for this that I did for you know, building my public website because now I just sort of have like one technology stack to to support, right? I think there are advantages there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if like, right, five years from now, people, people have asked this question many times, like five years from now, are you still going to be doing Drupal development? It's really hard for me to say that guaranteed that something else will not come along that's like, oh no, this is such a better answer. But mm -hmm. from what I've seen so far, the mission of Drupal is still to sort of treat treat the data in such a way that it's both as flexible as possible and as useful as possible, right? And I don't know if I've ever seen something like that written down, but if you ask me, that's like the mission of Drupal is like your it's data gets this for the data. Sort of usable experience on top of it. Right. Well, I think you've solved it. I think you've solved all of Drupal's growing pain problems moving to Composer. So Good. you can have yourself a fine weekend now because you have, okay. and you've actually clear, you know, it, it's actually kind of interesting because I've been a little bit concerned about this, this, this direction as far as, you know, making Composer the one and only one way to get Drupal up and running and to build your code base. But it's kind of a, a simple and elegant solution where, yeah, that becomes the one and only one way for developers, but there's nothing stopping us from pre-packaging pre all of these different, you know, very friendly, accessible, usable, you know, pre-built packages of code for people. Yeah, I mean, right now there is there is this race to see who gets the top 10%, right? The And by I guess top 10%, what I mean is of the money. <laughs> so, you know, the, the top 10% of websites that are built in Drupal are probably consuming 60% of the budget that gets, gets it spent on Drupal sites, if I have to guess, right? The like plus $250,000 projects that are out there, 
are sort of like where all the, you know, uh, sort of these larger Drupal companies, right? Like the ones that have 50 plus employees, let's say, you know, and the smaller ones are competing for those projects too, but there's usually other people helping out there. Like mm -hmm. if you're gonna spend a million dollars on something, you're probably not gonna spend it with a company that only has three employees. Right. So so the the sort of like medium to large Drupal agencies are looking for that like top of the market, but the bottom of the market I think is gonna end up being sort of controlled by services, right? Software as a service. So th if, if it doesn't go that way, then Drupal basically has to leave the hobbyists behind because there won't be anyone using it who still you know has that as their use case right sort of like those those small websites that you could build in a weekend mm -hmm. if if no one's spending money on them then then what but, what is the impetus for people to keep building drupal to support that use case right right it's almost a chicken and the egg because a lot of people and including you know i would argue you and i had our on ramp to Drupal because it was so accessible. Absolutely. So anyway, I think so close. I don't know if that was me cutting out or you cutting out. You made it so far with with good good video quality. Well, um, I think Mike's trying to wrap it up. Uh, I'm not sure if he can hear me. I'm not sure if I'm the one who's frozen. You're frozen. I'm not frozen. <laughs> I have no idea. All right. <laughs> say say your last sentence one more time. I was going to say, um, if you're going to check out Dries's article, by all means, read through the comments because the comments are perhaps as interesting, if not more interesting and insightful than the blog post. Well, and we should go ahead and post our video as a comment as well. We could. Absolutely. All right. You want to wrap things up? Yeah. Uh, this has been the Drupal Easy Podcast. We post new stuff there approximately every two weeks at drupaleasy.com slash podcast. Uh, we have a regular cast of co-hosts, including Ted Bowman, who works uh, at the office of the CTO, working on Drupal core stuff all the time, Kelly Curry and Anna Colada, who do Drupal front end stuff. Uh, myself, I work at palantir.net, and you can uh, check out all our fun stuff over there. And Mike, you do independent Drupal training, Drupal Easy, and you're teaching workshop at DrupalCon. You want to tell people about it? Yeah, actually, Ted and I, Ted's going to be helping me out. Um, introduction to Drupal 8 module development um, at DrupalCon Baltimore, full day training on Monday. Early bird pricing is currently in effect, so check that out. And you've missed one member. I don't know if you missed him. Of course, Andrew Riley, okay. working at Red Hat in the coal mines. <laughs> in the coal Sometimes mines. he comes out with like his lungs all blackened and his little hard hat on and says, hey, guys, I'm ready to do a podcast with you. Actually... Did we just have him on recently? So we did. And now I'm picturing him as um, Ben Stiller's father from a Zoolander coming out of the coal mines. <laughs> so thank you for that image. Appreciate it. Uh, we post <laughs> stories that we're going to be talking about upcoming podcast on Reddit at uh, subreddit, which is Drupal Easy Podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, a lot of the usual suspects. And for sure, look for us in Baltimore. I think that we have pretty much run out of our time for today. I wish you all a happy Drupal. See ya!